Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. After deadly suicide bombing, Yemen marks National Unity Day. UN nuclear watchdog expects deal with Iran as U.S. imposes more sanctions. And Lebanon frees anti-Assad activists to defuse tension. Mosaic, world news from the Middle East begins now. In Yemen, President Abdurrabu Mansour Hedi vowed to intensify security forces' efforts against those whom he described as terrorists. And during a military parade marking the unification, Hedi asserted that the security services will be more determined to track down those whom he called terrorists. The military parade was held one day after a suicide bombing caused the death of 90 people and injured at least 200. It was the first time that a military parade was held to mark the unification of Yemen without Ali Abdullah Saleh, who was toppled by a popular revolution. And indifferent to the recommendation of analysts who warned of increased security concerns, President Abdurrabu Mansur Hadi attended the parade. It was held at the Institute of Aviation instead of the Al Sabin area, which was subjected to a bombing that led to the deaths of dozens of soldiers and injured hundreds during the preparatory exercises for the parade. As analysts have seen, Hadi was able to foil attempts by any group to sabotage the unity celebration. This was an effort by Hadi to reassure his authorities while weakening his predecessor's position. And this is how the armed forces addressed President Hadi. Your path to bring the nation safely to shore despite the waves of disagreement has played a major role in the efforts of security and armed forces to unite the country and end the division. The capital is witnessing heightened security measures, especially in the al Sitin area, which is home to President Hadi. While the investigation into the al Sabin street bombing continues, the head of the National Security Council confirmed that the Al-Qaeda organization was behind the attack. Al-Qaeda admitted its responsibility for the attack, and this was confirmed by a media spokesman in Shabwa province. Politically and publicly, local and international condemnation continues. The revolutionary youths announced a three-day mourning period and the cancellation of all unity celebrations. Other challenges coincided with the occasion, most notably the debate over the so-called southern plight and the redrawing of the country's unification in a way that will dispel the effects of the 1994 war that erupted between the two unity partners. It seems that ousted Yemeni President Ali Abdullah Saleh is losing momentum day by day, while President Hadi is continuing to enjoy local and international support. Meanwhile, the Yemeni people want to see their country free of violence after enduring years of suffering. Hamdi al-Bukhari, Al Jazeera, Sana'a. Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency, Yuki Amano, announced that the IAEA and Iran will soon sign an agreement on Iran's nuclear program. Speaking in Vienna airport upon his return from Tehran, Amano said that he and Saeed Jalili, secretary of Iran's Supreme National Security Council, reached an agreement on a systematic plan to clear up ambiguity and resolve any remaining issues between the two sides. Amano considered the decision an important development and described his talks with Jalili in Tehran as extremely helpful and positive. Amano's announcement came on the eve of a round of talks in Baghdad between Iran and the six major powers. Our Al Alam reporter quoted Michael Mann, spokesman for EU foreign policy chief Catherine Ashton, as saying that the six countries will present new proposals and talks should cover essential issues. Meanwhile, Iran welcomed realistic and equitable talks. Only one day until Iran and the six countries hold their important and anticipated negotiations in Baghdad. On the eve of the meeting, Iran, through the Speaker of its Parliament, Ali Larajani, welcomed any realistic and equitable negotiations, while insisting on upholding its lawful rights. 
During a parliamentary session, Larajani asserted that his country is seeking a solution through serious negotiations and is waiting for Western countries to change their hostile policies and cease their deception in political games. The Secretary of Iran's Supreme National Security Council, Saeed Jalili, stated from Baghdad that the Istanbul talks were a starting point. They laid the foundation, and Iran aims to achieve further progress in the Baghdad meeting. We should say that the Istanbul negotiations were a starting point, and they laid out the groundwork. And today in Baghdad, we'll try to bring about further progress with the P5 plus 1 group in order to achieve overdue goals. Jalili held successful talks with the Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency, Yukia Amano, in Tehran. Amano described his discussions with Jalili as extremely positive and helpful. Upon his return to Vienna, Amano said that a decision was made for reaching an agreement between Iran and the agency, which will be signed very soon. The atmosphere of the negotiations was also praised in the statements of Iran's Foreign Minister Ali Akbar Salehi, who spoke during his meeting with Amano of opening a new and constructive channel for cooperation between Tehran and the IAEA based on mutual trust and understanding. He stressed the importance of focusing on the disarmament of nuclear weapons, in addition to preventing their proliferation. While it seemed clear that Salehi was pointing to the Israeli entity's nuclear arsenals, the entity's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu called on the sextet to tighten its noose on Iran. He demanded the cessation of any Iranian nuclear activity, as well as the dismantling of of Iran's nuclear facilities. Netanyahu justified his demands by saying that Tehran is pursuing the destruction of the Israeli entity and that it supports revolutionary parties in the region. In another provocative move, the U.S. Senate approved a new package of economic sanctions targeting the Iranian oil sector. The new package extends sanctions to cover commerce with the National Iranian Oil Company and the National Iranian Tanker Company, and it aims to prevent Tehran from continuing to sell oil. Iran and the P5 plus one group are slated to meet tomorrow in Baghdad for a new round of nuclear talks. It's the first time in history that Iraq is hosting such a gathering. Despite the closure of Baghdad International Airport due to a dust storm, last-minute logistic and security preparations are underway in the Iraqi capital. As is the case with every international event, the heightening of security measures usually restricts the movement of Baghdadis. Shafiq Abdel Jabbar reports from Baghdad. In its preparatory measures to host a new round of nuclear talks between Iran and the P5 plus one, Baghdad is facing a number of challenges, most notably maintaining security. 20,000 members of security and military forces will be deployed around Baghdad's green zone and airport, backed by 15 helicopters to protect Iraqi airspace. The measures include imposing a partial curfew, which is causing restriction of movement and public resentment in Baghdad. Any security measure in the country causes gridlock in the streets, especially with the closure of major roads in Baghdad. The government must take security measures due to the deteriorating situation. Having said that, the closure of roads hurts businesses, students and workers. By hosting the summit and mediating the dispute between Iran and the international community, Iraq wants to show that it can still play a regional role while ruling out any political intervention. The conference that will be held tomorrow with the P5 plus one shows the great return of Iraq to the international arena. Iraq also hosted the Arab summit. This shows that Iraq has returned with full force to both the Arab and international arenas. Only hours are separating Baghdad from the international conference. However, a dust storm lingering in the capital has led to the indefinite closure of Baghdad airport, which may delay the meeting. Baghdad is putting its security and political challenges aside in order to host the Iranian nuclear negotiations. 
but it has ignored the challenges of nature. These dust storms, if they continue as expected, may reflect negatively on the conference, especially in light of the closure of Baghdad airport. Shafiq Abdel-Jabbar, Dubai TV, Baghdad. Thousands, including security forces, have lost their lives since last March in, of course, uh, Syria. Now, Lebanese cleric Shadi al Molawi, who's an outspoken critic of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad, has been bailed out. His arrest earlier this month led to several days of deadly clashes between supporters and opponents of the Syrian government in Lebanon's northern city of Tripoli. Reports say Molawi was arrested after Lebanon received intelligence from Western sources. Press TV's Ali Risk tells us more. The head of general security in Lebanon said that his arrest was made after the Lebanese were given intelligence tips from Western sources, not from pro-Syrian sources, but from Western intelligence presumed to be the CIA. So when there are these outside bodies involved, many people say that there should be no doubt that Molui is in fact affiliated with terrorist groups and affiliated with al-Qaeda. Now, uh, previously, of course, Molawi was kept in custody by the Lebanese judiciary. It, was, it wasn't until after the violence erupted and after some of the anti-Syrian Sunni groups escalated their stances and violence even reached the capital of, capital of Beirut, it was only after that that his case was looked into once again and then he was released on bail. So many people are saying that this was made, this decision to release him was made under pressure which was coming out from the streets. Molawi is, is suspected to have links with certain Qatari and Jordanian nationals. In fact, it was the arrest of a Jordanian national which led to Shadil Molawi. Shadil Molawi is said to be, uh, uh, is said to play an important part in, trans in transporting assistance, including weaponry, to the Syrian opposition. This is, this is what is said by some of the Lebanese authorities. This is what is said also by other people who are supportive of the regime of Bashar al-Assad. On the other hand, I have to say as well that the Salafists, some people in the Salafist movement who I have spoken to say that Maulawi has nothing to do with al-Qaeda whatsoever and that his arrest was just something which was made by the Lebanese army for no, for the, from the Lebanese general security for no clear reason other than the fact that the Lebanese general security is trying to wage a war on the Sunnis. However, that argument appears to be very weak because it, it's very difficult to believe that the Lebanese general security would go ahead and arrest someone for no apparent clear reason. Also in the news today, just one day to go until Egypt's presidential election. People are set to get their first real opportunity to choose their leader. The vote is expected to be the most competitive presidential election in Egypt's history. It comes a year after the fall of former President Hosni Mubarak. Over 50 million people are registered to vote. The first round takes place on Wednesday and Thursday, with official results due out a week later. Twelve candidates are running. The top hopefuls, former Arab League chief Amr Musa, the Muslim Brotherhood's Mohamed Morsi, independent Islamic candidate Abdul Munim Abul Fatuh, and Mubarak's last Prime Minister Ahmed Shafiq. Well, he's been on a hunger strike for more than a hundred days now. Sitting on a wheelchair, Bahraini activist Abdul Hadi Al Khawaja appeared in court earlier on Tuesday. This is the first time Khawaja is attending his trial since he started refusing food. The rights activist called the proceedings a sham. He also spoke of his plight in custody, being sexually abused, humiliated and force-fed. Khawaja has become a symbol of Bahrain's revolution that started over a year ago. The regime's response to anti-government protests has been brutal. Scores have been killed in a crackdown by Bahrain's Saudi-backed troops. Syria's local coordination committees said nine people were killed by security forces gunfire across different areas in Syria. Meanwhile, Syrian state news agency Sana said five others were killed in a bombing in Damascus. A number of areas in the countryside of Idlib and Homs are being shelled by the regime's army, which stormed two towns, Dael and Dara, and Hyaline in Hama, leading to dozens of casualties.
According to Syrian State TV, an explosive device was planted overnight by terrorists and detonated in a restaurant in Al Qaboon neighborhood. Five civilians were murdered and others were wounded in a bomb explosion that was planted by an armed terrorist group last night in the neighborhood of Al Qaboon in Damascus. Meanwhile, according to the activist version, a new bombing hit a civilian area in a rebelling Damascus neighborhood in order to divert the attention of the observers from what is happening in other neighborhoods and to spread terror in the capital. We are holding Bashar al-Assad's regime accountable for this bombing. I am telling you, the bombing took place in a vegetable market next to the police station of Al-Kabun and 50 meters from the command center of the special forces units. Who is responsible for the security of that area? Is it the Free Syrian Army or Bashar al-Assad's army? One of these aforementioned areas is the Barza neighborhood, which was stormed by security forces as shown in videos uploaded online. It also showed the arrest campaigns carried out against dozens of activists, according to the Syrian Observatory for human rights. في إدلب تعرضت معرض النعمان. إدلب مرات النعمان and the countryside of Kfaruma were shelled by the regime using warplanes, according to local coordination committees. في هذا الوقت كان المراقبون. At the time, the UN observers were visiting the town of Marat Nasrin, which welcomed them with a demonstration. This comes a day after the observers mediated an unprecedented exchange deal in Khan Sheikhoun. Colonel Ahmed Hamish and the observers accompanying him intervened to facilitate the swap deal between the regime's army and local residents. The residents returned a tank that was burned by the Free Syrian Army in response to what activists claimed to be a massacre committed by the regime's army last week in exchange for the release of two detainees. Many people doubt the observer's capability to expand the successful exchange deal in order to end the military solution and replace it with a political one. Zan al Hayyam, BBC. Muslim Day celebrations were marred by violence yesterday evening as 15 people were arrested when skirmishes broke out near the old city. Clashes erupted when 50,000 Israelis passed the Damascus Gate on their way to the Western Wall and were attacked by a group of Arabs from East Jerusalem. Five of the Arab assailants were arrested for throwing objects at the marchers and 10 Jews were arrested for chanting racist slogans. Officers on horseback intervened to stop the violence from both sides. The police issued a statement saying that the tensions between Jews and Arabs are a natural part of Jerusalem Day activities and that all who broke the law were dealt with firmly. Meanwhile, speaking at a Jerusalem Day event, Prime Minister Netanyahu vowed that the city will remain the united capital of the Jewish people. Netanyahu told the cheering crowd that Israel will protect Jerusalem because without it, the Jewish people are like a body without a heart. The Prime Minister went on to say that giving up a united Jerusalem would show weakness to Israel's enemies. The issue of illegal migrants here in Israel was the main focus of the annual law conference in Elat. Justice Minister Yaakov Neaman said that Israel is taking steps to expel infiltrators and that all branches of government are, quote, working to eliminate this scourge from the country. Neaman said Israel has a multi-pronged policy that includes building a fence along the Egyptian border, deportation of migrants, and the creation of detention facilities to house them until they are expelled. Meanwhile, several MKs slammed the government today at a stormy meeting of the Knesset Committee on Foreign Workers. Merit's MK, Nitzan Horowitz, condemned the coalition policy as racist and a total failure, while Hadash MK, Dov Hanin, described the situation as a catastrophe. Others pointed fingers directly at illegal migrants. Likud MK, Danny Danone, called them the enemy, while Likud's Ofer Akunis said they represent a social time bomb. Joining us now in the studio to discuss the tall law and the issue of illegal migrants is Kadima Knesset member Dr. Nachman Shai. Good evening, Dr. Shai. Good evening. Thanks for being with us tonight. Thank you. The committee tasked with revising the controversial tall law on mandatory army service is meeting today for the first time. Do you believe that those discussions will yield any real change? 
I wish. I want to believe because this was the major reason for us to join the coalition at the last moment, which I'm not very happy so about. So uh, I think this can serve us at least to justify to uh, over 700,000 Israelis that supported Kadima last time that there's something in that. We'll do our best. We'll do our best because uh, we need it. It's not only a political matter. It's really at the heart of the Israeli society to finally reach equality between uh, Israelis, young Israelis that should serve either in the military or civil, uh, civil service. Dov uh, Hanin of the uh, an M MK with the Hadash party told IBA News recently there is a sneaky underhand deal working between uh, the government, I assume, and members of the ultra-Orthodox parties. Have you heard about any sort of under-the-table deal? And, and is, are the religious parties so powerful that they can force the government to accept a deal that is less than equitable? Yes, they are powerful. And they are powerful because they uh, are, in general, loyal to the, to the prime ministers and to the governments. And they also do not involve themselves in issues that are not in the core of their own business, which means mainly foreign affairs and even uh, national affairs. They don't uh, uh, take any position. So it's very helpful. That's why they make their power so important and, 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 and relevant to the governments. In this matter, I don't know about any deal. I know that for us, it's, uh, it's a crucial issue to get this uh, new tal law or whatever it will be called uh, to be passed by the Knesset in the next few months. Otherwise, we'll have to leave the coalition. Let's move on now to the issue of illegal migrants here in Israel. Yeah. It's obviously a very hot topic, an emotionally charged issue. Do you share the same fears as many of those MKs we just spoke about, uh, that this is an existential threat to Israel? What should be done about this? Existential threat means that this country will be destroyed as a result of it. No. But it, will, it may easily and gradually change uh, somehow the character of this country. If we have few hundred thousand illegal immigrants living with us, uh, the society, the Israeli society, wouldn't be the same. We have to be tuned to their needs. We have to help them, but we have to get them out of the country as soon as possible and to give them shelter somewhere else or maybe even to their own countries to send them back because otherwise if they stay here, I'm telling you, Israel wouldn't be the same. Mali's interim president, Dion Kunda Traore, was severely injured when a number of protesters, demanding his resignation, stormed his office in Bamako, according to local sources. In other related news in Africa, while Mali has agreed to extend the country's transitional period towards the presidential elections, ambiguity still dominates the political scene in Guinea-Bissau. As for Cote d'Ivoire, its refugees are returning to the country as it becomes becomes relatively more stable. Ibrahim Al Khalid Turbash reports. President Dion Kunda Traore will continue to lead the transitional phase in Mali until the upcoming presidential elections. This was agreed upon between the leaders of the military coup and the economic community of West African states, ECOWAS. This principal agreement roused protests of nearly 30,000 Malians in the capital who claim that the agreement prevents Malians from determining their own fate. Guinea-Bissau is another centre of tension in Africa. After the UN Security Council imposed a package of sanctions on leaders of the coup this past April, the Bissau parliament reached an agreement to resolve the crisis. Opposition parties and leaders of the military coup signed the agreement, which stipulates to conduct direct internal reforms in various sectors and restructure the National Electoral Committee. As for Côte d'Ivoire, it is witnessing the return of 5,000 Ivorian refugees who had fled the country due to the recent incidents. Research studies on illegal immigration found that reasons for immigration vary between deteriorating economy, lack of job opportunities, and an educational policy that does not enhance the concept of belonging. In light of a seminar held by Save the Children Foundation, participants assured that the solution lies in the hands of a government institution by providing job opportunities for the youths and developing legal channels for them to travel abroad. They are in two caskets that look like boats in the sea. They dream of abundant money that can change their financial status and life in general for the better. At the end, illegal immigration can lead to death.
First, there is a lack of suitable job opportunities that provides enough income for people to build a future and, if they are old, to build a family and to fulfill their family's needs. Second, poverty does not necessarily lead to immigration, but a poor society and a poor environment does, especially when people can't find jobs to generate enough income to fulfill their needs. The immigrants traveling to their host countries usually find their ambitions a mirage that does not become a reality. However, it helps others who are in those countries to set up fictitious networks to promote the idea of illegal immigration in order to collect large sums of money. People love their country a lot, and we all love Egypt. But the problem is there is no job opportunity. The youth don't feel like their country gives them the respect they deserve. The government has to provide alternative job opportunities for these youths internally in the form of training opportunities, job opportunities or subsidies because most of these areas are very poor and do not have the prospect of growth or access to different job opportunities and to develop their skills. It is a shared responsibility between the state and the family to provide a prosperous economic environment and a good education, or else it causes the immigrant to think, in any case, I await death. Ahmed Abil, Nile TV. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible by grants from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Winco Foundation, the Firedall Foundation, and by support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online. Stay up to date with breaking news, read our blog, get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. channel of uncompromising stories, world news, documentaries, entertainment, and culture. Link TV, connecting you to the world. For more information, visit linktv.org.